So, hello. Welcome to Mathematical Image Processing Exercise 8. Today we are going to look at the Perona Malik equation, which is a nonlinear diffusion equation. You see it here on the left hand side. It's it's a, it's a diffusion equation. The nonlinearity comes from the fact that this function g here um, usually is not linear. So one example for g would be a function like this, or uh, g2 with an exponential. Both of those are not linear. And as you saw in the lecture, a nonlinear diffusion equation can help us to keep edges in our images while smoothing out the noise that may persist. In this exercise, we want to take a little bit a closer look on the one-dimensional equation in order to understand why this equation works, how it does. In particular, we want to get a feel on this parameter kappa that uh, comes with all of uh, these functions g that we have here. Maybe to get started, let us first recall some of the notions of um, differential calculus. So this is just a, a repetition. So assume we have a vector field f with components f1, f2, up to component d, if I'm in d-dimensional space. So here I have a vector field. And now I take the divergence operator. So by definition, the divergence is nothing else than the sum over the first derivatives. Yeah, so the divergence of f is the sum over the first derivatives of our function f. So I start out with a vector field. And what I get is now a scalar function or field. So the divergence operator, sometimes it's also denoted by just using the nabla and then a scalar product. Um, the divergence operator lowers the order of our tensor. Yeah, it goes from a vector to a scalar. So, and this is already the first operator that we find here, also in our the diffusion equation and the Perona Malik equation. It's the divergence operator. Now let us look at the opposite case. So let's say G is a scalar field. And now I take the gradient. So sometimes we write grad or just nabla without the dot. Then the gradient of a scalar field, g, will be the vector of first derivatives. First, so the first derivative with respect to the first argument of g, then the second derivative with respect, uh, the, the first derivative with respect to the second argument of g up to uh, dd of g, so the last. Um, component, deriving with respect to the last component. And now I started out with a scalar field and I get a vector field. So if I start with a, with a zero order tensor, then I get one of order one. Yeah? From a scalar, I get a vector. So the gradient is also part here and here. And so what's interesting now is the interplay of the divergence and the gradient, yeah, because with the gradient, I go from a scalar to a vector. And with the divergence, I can go from a vector back to a scalar. So the concatenation of both. So let's say I start with a scalar field h. And now I take divergence of the gradient of a function. Yeah. Then I take, so let's say I take the divergence of the gradient of h. 
This is nothing else than the divergence of the vector of first derivatives of h. And this is nothing else than the sum over the first derivatives of the corresponding first derivative of h. From i going from 1 to d. And this is an operator that you may also know from the lecture because this is just the sum over the second derivatives of h and this is also called the Laplacian of h in this case. Yeah? And once again, this is a scalar field. So, and you saw in the lecture that the Laplacian using it uh, as a differential operator in a partial differential equation like this, it helps with one problem, which is smoothing out the image and getting rid of the noise. But at, this, at the, um, the same time, the Laplace operator um, works the same at each position of our image. So the Laplace operator does not see structure. And what we want to achieve is to have diffusion at well, large regions of our image where there is noise, but we do not want to have diffusion at parts um, where there is an edge. And this is where this, this prefactor g or this function comes into play because it now is a function of the gradient itself. And note that we use the gradient as an indicator whether there is an edge or not. So large gradients will correspond to edges. And looking at these functions, we see that if the gradient is large, meaning that we are in, a, in this region, there is this function g has a very low value, meaning that the diffusion is very low. So the degree of diffusion is very little. On the other hand, if there is no gradient, so this would be uh, more or less of a flat region in our image, then there is a high degree of diffusion. So far for the intuition. But now we want to see that this really works. And um, we want to do this in the example of the uh, perona malik equation. So I have a copy here of this equation. This is just, just the equation from the left-hand side. So, and we want to make it as simple as possible. And you will see it, it still gets very complicated, but um, you may maybe get also a feel for why this equation is, is very complicated. So it's not well understood how it, how it works from the theoretical point of view. But on the other hand, um, in the applications, we see that this equation works very well. That's, that's why we want to study it and understand it a little bit better. So this is just a general equation in uh, RD. And now let us go to the case that we are one dimensional. In this case, the gradient of a function u is just the derivative of u with respect to the spatial var variable. So now we have just two variables. One is time. And the other one is x, the space. In particular, our operator here, our differential operator, is just um, well, it's just the derivative of g of uh, yeah. So the gradient of u is just u prime, and take the derivative. So this is so our our scalar version, or no, scalar version is the wrong term. It's it's already a scalar version. But our one-dimensional version of this equation is just partial derivative respect to, with respect to time of u equals g, which is a is a smooth function of the absolute value of the first derivative respect to space times the first derivative with respect to space. Okay. 
So now let's let's do a little bit of calculation here. So if I if I just want to resolve this first derivative here using the product rule, I get something like this. So I get the g of absolute value of u prime. So this is the first factor derived and then plus g of u prime u double prime. This is the second factor. And now using the chain rule, uh, all, all those rules that you know from uh, first semester of calculus now, now get a use, um, we get g prime of the absolute value of u prime times u prime. Here I, I do a little bit of calculation with the absolute value and the u that is outside plus g of u prime. And now I have a u double prime at both um, in both factors. So, and what we can see here is I have here a second derivative, which is, well, our Laplacian. So this is the basic component of our our diffusion equations because we know that the Laplace operator is good for, for diffusion. It's in some sense um, a discrete limit of, as you saw in the lecture, of uh, taking mean values uh, across large regions. So this is a good, um, a good ingredient. So and now we have here a part that uh, con controls the diffusion intensity. And we have here something that uh, one sometimes calls uh, like a flux. And this also uh, controls, um, this also controls the diffusion in some sense. So in the case that we are going to look at here, we will always say, look at cases where um, the, the first derivative is greater than zero. In this case, we can uh, resolve these absolute values here and we get out that g prime of u prime times u prime plus g of u prime times u prime prime. So this is this is a simplification that of course for u at the moment falls out of the sky. And it, it is not true because sometimes the gradient will be negative as well. But for the examples that we are going to look at, um, this one will always be true. And also if one wants to see this one dimensional case as a special case of, a, uh, of the d-dimensional case, one will also always get to the point where one can assume that the first derivative is greater than zero. So, okay, so far for the first derivative here. So we want to work or we want to see how solutions to the perona malik equation behave at the position of edges. And for this, um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to define an edge. So I have the definition here. Maybe I zoom in a little so you can see it more clearly what this definition means. So we have an edge if the three conditions here hold. So the first derivative should be greater than zero in absolute value. In our case, this corresponds, or this, this just means that the first derivative is greater than zero at the position of the edge. So the second derivative is zero, which means we have an inflection point. And the third condition tells us a little bit about this type of inflection point. And in our setting, if u prime of x0 is already greater than zero, then also u triple prime of x0 will be greater than zero. So this is like a reduced set of assumptions uh, that we will work with. So this uh, is the wrong relation symbol. Okay, so let me copy these conditions here. So we have them handy. And then let's look at uh, the different cases that you also find in this exercise of this inflection point that the that uh, 
point three is aiming at. So the first derivative is greater than zero in both examples. Why can we see that? Well, if we take a tangent line here, we see it has a it has a positive slope, the same as in here. Yeah? So this means uh, those are the types of edges that you need to think about when we work through this exercise. Yeah? So this means that u prime at x0, yeah, so this here is the position x0, is greater than 0. So the second condition is a necessary condition for inflection points. Yeah? So if inflection point is, um, is the point where our curve so thinking about a one-dimensional image as a curve, where the curve changes its curvature. So this is always a necessary condition. This one is always necessary. And the last one, well, the last one is precisely the one that helps us to distinguish between the left-hand case, which means that u prime of x0 is smaller than 0, and the right-hand case, where the third derivative at x0 is larger than 0. Yeah? And so the left, what we see on the left-hand side, this is what we, what we want to think about when we talk about an edge. And this, what we see on the right-hand side, this, this won't count as an edge um, regard, uh, with regards to our definition. So this is just a set of of assumptions that we need to make in order to talk about an edge. And now in the first part of this exercise, um, we want to do the following. We want now to see how the solutions to the corona malik equation behave uh, res with respect to these three conditions. Maybe before we get into, um, into the, the proof, of these um, of these three results that we have here, let us first work through the note that tells us how to interpret all of these um, all of these three things that come out of a solution. So the first one tells us that the the slope of our uh, function will change over time depending on the flux. Yeah? So, and if the flux is greater than zero, the slope will change differently from a, a negative flux here. The second condition tells us that an inflection point will stay at the position where it is, and it will stay in an inflection point. Therefore, the necessary condition, which is also the second condition here, will not change over time. So the change over time, you can always see that we are talking about it because we always have the first time derivative here. And the third condition is a little bit more complicated. So forget for, for now, maybe forget about the right hand side, but on the left hand side we have the third derivative. And the third derivative has um yeah the third derivative tells us which type of uh, image I'm in. And if I can control how the third derivative changes or I, I know how it how it changes, then I also know if maybe an edge wants to change its behavior to something like we have here on the right hand side. Yeah, so is an edge going to stay an edge or will it change to something that we don't consider an edge? So this is what the third condition is about. So now let's let's get started. So we have already done a great part of uh, of the statement one because we started out with the derivative and we wrote it uh, as follows. So now what we are interested in is the first derivative. Of um, of u prime, yeah, and by Schwarz's uh, theorem, we know this is nothing else than taking the derivative of the time derivative, yeah. So we can change the 
order of different, differentiation. So this comes from Schwarz. So then we do a little step in between. By rewriting this part here via the flux function f of s times uh, uh, f of s equals to s times g of s. So for this, do a little side calculation. So f of s is by definition s of g of s. So I'm now taking the first derivative. So I know that then I, I will need something like this because it also turns up here. So the first derivative f prime of s will equal now again by the product rule g of s plus s g prime of s. So by using the flux, flux function, I can rewrite this equation by just writing it's f prime of u prime times u double prime. Now, so I, I just get this result when I plug in um, u prime for s. Now I, I know I have an expression for the first time derivative of u. Now for the spatial derivative of the first time derivative, I need to calculate the derivative of f prime of u prime, u double prime. And again, by the product rule, I get the following result. So I get u triple prime, so make this a little bit more clearer. U triple prime times F prime U prime plus, and now comes a little bit lengthier calculation. So I need to calculate the derivative of F prime of U prime times U double prime. And this is via the chain rule. So let me just copy the first part. And via the chain rule, I get f double prime of u prime times u double prime. And not to forget the double prime that I already have here. So this calculation is always true. But um, I want now to use the fact that I, I evaluate this equation now at the precise point x0 at time t0, where I also have an edge. So because at an edge, we have further conditions, namely these three, that we can use. And to see how difficult the analysis of this equation is, we even need a further condition, namely on the fourth derivative of u to also be 0 here. So we, we plug in these assumptions and see that now um, we can derive this nice equation here. Um, I, I think we don't need this assumption yet. So we will need it. I think we will need it later. So for this part, I think we can just work with what, what we have for an edge. I see here second derivatives of u. So if I evaluate this, in x0, t0, then I just cross out these products here and I am left with u triple prime of f prime of u prime, which is precisely what we wanted to show here. So for the second derivative, we can do something similar. So I'm going to spare you the details. Um, so let's maybe maybe do some if if you want to verify these calculations, I'll give you at least some results here. So we now want to show that the second derivative does not change over time. So in this case, um, uh, what we do is well we take the second derivative or the time derivative of the second derivative which is, again, by Schwarz's theorem, the first derivative of the time derivative of the first derivative. 
So, but this, this inner part here is something that we just calculated in the step before, which means I can, uh, I can use it. So what I do is now, I just copy this part here under the derivative. Also, now at this point, I need the fact that well, I, I still haven't evaluated this equation at the precise point. So now I need to calculate the derivative of this. So let me maybe give you an intermediate result. So if we resolve this, hopefully I can copy this correctly, already prepared something to save some time, I should get something that looks like this. So some calculations here. So now, I have a necessary condition. So I really want this equation to be zero at x0, t0. So now if I just know that I'm in an edge, then I know that um, this guy here is zero, this is also zero, and this here is also zero because all of these terms contain a second derivative with respect to space. But in here, I have a problematic term. I have that also the fourth derivative uh, comes up and I have nothing else to control it. So if I really want this to be zero, then either the flux could be zero, uh, but flux being zero is, is a bad idea because um, or the, 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 that the derivative of the flux will be zero means there is, there's no change at all because of the first equation. So this won't won't be equal to zero, or we cannot assume, or um, yeah, that this is zero. But for the fourth um, for the fourth derivative, we can assume this, and this will guarantee us that um, that the time derivative of the second derivative is zero, meaning that an inflection point stays an inflection point. Yeah. So this is where we need this additional assumption that the fourth derivative in space equals uh, at x0, t0 equals zero by assumption. So I think I'm also going to spare you the details uh, of verifying part three. Um, it will be in the in the notes that I uploaded uh, that I will upload because it's it's a very lengthy calculation, but it's it's not new. So in in fact, you will always just um, yeah just just calculate uh, with the basic rules of differentiation um, the derivatives here, and you get now well this this third condition that tells you if an inflection point is going to change its type. So up to this point, we have not yet used special functions g that, um, that are in our Perona-Malik equation. So and this, is, this is what we now do in the second part. So we put in even more additional assumptions now on the concrete shape of, S, uh, of f via the functions g that we have here. So we choose one of these functions g and plug it in here and derive additional behavior. And this behavior will help us to understand how a function reacts um, or a solution to this equation reacts depending on how steep an edge is. So once again, um, so in addition to the assumptions that we already had in part one, uh, we now take the function g1, maybe I also copy this one so we know what we are talking about. So we take this function g1 and now want to show the following. And now it's, it gets interesting because now we plug in further information on how steep an edge is. Yeah, so note that this function g always comes with a, an additional parameter which is kappa. And so the first condition tells us the following. How does the first derivative 
change over time. So will it get bigger? Then this means our edge will get steeper. Will it get lower? This means our edge will get flatter. Yeah, so a flat edge or well, a flat slope corresponds to also a flat region in our image. So and it tells us that this is precisely then the case when the derivative or the absolute value of the derivative is smaller than this kappa. Yeah, I say the absolute value because in the end we are always taking squares here. So and in order to calculate um, this part, uh, we, we first need to start by calculating a flux. So we need because uh, let me go up to the result that we first had on the first derivative. So I just copy this part here. So this of course still holds. But now I now I now want to plug in further information on the flux. Yeah, now I, I know how the flux should look like and I can calculate this flux and um, what I will get is, uh, well, also a result that I'm just going to, to copy and paste for you, or maybe I just write it down. So um, in this case, we get that the corresponding flux, so the flux was defined as f1 of s equals s times g of s. So the corresponding flux will have the derivative f1 prime of s equal to 1 over s squared over kappa squared divided by 1 plus s squared over kappa squared squared. So this is also just a basic calculation that you can uh, do for yourself once you just take the derivative of this function, um, plug in the function of g, you will need a quotient rule and then this, um, this just comes out. So, and what we can observe from this flux is that f prime of s is smaller than zero if s is greater than kappa. Where do we see this part? For this, we need to, to take a look at the numerator. So if s is greater than kappa, then also s squared is greater than kappa squared. And this means that this part here will be greater than one. And if I subtract something greater than one from one, it gets negative. And the denominator is not going to change this because the denominator is always positive, thanks to the square. So f prime of s is always less than zero if s is greater than kappa. So now let us take a look at the left part here of the statement. So the first derivative of u prime should be greater than zero if u prime is greater than kappa. If u prime is greater than kappa, so if u prime of x zero t zero is greater than kappa, then f prime of u prime is smaller than zero by what we just discussed. At the same hand, I know that the third derivative will always be smaller than zero. Uh, because this is just one of the assumptions that we had for an edge. Uh, if I scroll upward, you will see once again, this was uh, the third condition that we had on an edge. So now I have something smaller than zero times something smaller than zero. This will give me that the result is actually larger than zero. So the second, the second condition is a little bit easier because it always holds. It, it, does, not, it does not involve um, g at all uh, or g1 at all. If we look up what we just saw here, it just is zero nevertheless what, what we plug in for f because all of the functions u that I multiply f with, they are already zero. So of course, so the second part uh, is maintained. The third part is once again a 
a very lengthy calculation, but it tells you now something more interesting about the first derivative with respect to time of the third spatial derivative. We saw it gave us a very lengthy and nasty expression that we did not know how to interpret. Um, so it was, it, it was so ugly that I did not even share uh, the calculation with you, but we see it, we see it here. So this is the result and it's, it's hard to interpret it. But once we plug in knowledge about f, f prime and f double prime, things that we can just calculate by hand easily, yeah, because it's just, it's just a nice function. We take derivatives and then, okay, quotient rule and, um, then you know how it goes, you get an expression, and then you, you, you may see how you can interpret it or not. Using this expression, we can now use further assumptions in order to know, well, when will something be bigger than zero or smaller than zero. So, um, and in this case, what we get is the third derivative the one that controls whether we are in the left picture or in the right picture will change and it will so it will, will get smaller if the value of my derivative is between k and square root of 3 times k so the square root of 3 comes in once you do the calculation How can we really see what happens here? So the idea is that from the calculations we did, we can now um, construct basic examples where we can see each of these cases happening. Yeah, so if, the, if we have a very large gradient that is not within this interval here, we will see something happening. If it's smaller than kappa the gradient, we will also see something happening yeah, so the h edge will get flatter. If it's larger, then the h uh, then the edge will get bigger. And um, so this is what we what we are going to do is now construct a simple example and have a look at some pictures where these three cases come into play. So as an example, let us take Consider the function one half plus one half sinus of pi times x minus x zero. So this function has an edge at x zero. And if I calculate the first derivative, I should get something like pi halves of uh, cosine of pi times x minus x zero. So uh, the value of the first derivative is p halves, pi halves at x zero. So which is more or less 1.57. Of course, I also brought in some octave code. So I also extended this function by uh, constantly. So we have a little bit, uh, we get a bigger uh, domain. Let me close all maybe. So, so this is just how our function looks like. Uh, in our image, for example, we have a region that looks like this. So, and now according to whether we choose a, a lambda that is uh, that is very big, so it cannot be controlled uh, by our perona malik equation, what will happen is that the equation, as long as it runs, it will flatten out this edge. So, and this is what I what we do here in the, in the second part here. Just copy this and hope that it works. Ah, 
So I forget forgot one part. So let me do it again. So we solve this equation at two for two different time steps. So blue is at the time t0, then red is after one second, and yellow is after two seconds. Now, so we see this edge gets flattened out. So if I now choose um, the lambda in the correct um, in the correct region, so uh, the correct region would be that uh, I have lambda smaller than u prime of x zero, smaller than square root of lambda, yeah, which would be a region between zero point five and one point five seven for lambda. Then I should see that it actually gets steeper. So I hope um, this will run in time, but I also have a copy here that we can look at. So I just copy what I have here. What we see in this case, so if we take a lambda equal to 1.4, we see that we actually get some steepening here. Yeah, so now we have a, a sharper edge for lambda equals four. So if we take now lambda way too small, we will see an artifact that is called a uh, staircasing. Um, ah, this is the one I just ran here. So let's say I take, um, Let's do it like this. Let's say I take lambda equals, uh, like I did in this case, uh, to 0 0.5. Then I see that the inflection point is trying to change its type. And what happens is, uh, well, it stays an inflection point, of course, but I will get some sort of plateau, an artifact that I do not want to have in my image um, because I have an edge. And an edge should be sharp. It should not give rise to, uh, to uh, well, a level in between uh, the, the upper level and the lower level. It should just get sharp like it, just, like it did here. Yeah, so those are the three cases. Uh, so we have steepening, we have staircasing. Ah, let me also copy for you the, the part where we have a flattening of our image. This was the easy part. Yes, and we see that all this uh, was possible, or all this analysis was possible because we did some, uh, yeah, some calculations beforehand that told us how we need to choose lambda in order to make something like this happen. Of course, now in reality, the real problem starts. How should we know which kappa to choose for a given image? An image is a lot more complicated than a situation like this. And um, as far as I know, this is this is a very difficult problem, and it cannot be solved by handing someone a formula and say, "Well, plug it in, and you get your kappa." This is something that one will need to choose with with experience or other examples here. But in a very simple one-dimensional example, we see that the theory here actually produces expected results. And so that's it from my part for today. Um, I will upload some more calculations uh, in case that you want to verify everything that we did today uh, on your own. But I think for the intuition part, what we did here today uh, should be sufficient. And I think um, this or next week, you will also be implementing a, a Perona Malik um, solver uh, on your own to apply it to images. Mm -hmm.